Hi, my name is Claire. I'm 16. I'm just a normal teenager. Or I was, until recently. Have you ever dreamed of superpowers like those of comic book superheroes? Imagine that you have it, and because of this, life has become noticeably more difficult. Watch to the end, and you will learn how I learned to have X-ray vision. Recently, my mom and dad and I moved to a new house, and I had to go to a new school. I was very afraid that I would not be able to find friends quickly. I always thought I was a little strange and different from my peers. I often noticed that I had strange dreams and that I could feel if a person next to me was sad or unwell. My strange sensitivity, as I called it, was always treated poorly by my classmates. This was because I once asked my classmate Jack to be careful on his bike on the way to school because I had a bad dream. I didn't know why I asked him so confidently because it was just a dream. But on the way, his bike chain caught in his pants just like in my dream and he fell to the side of the road. Jack came up to me with a bandaged leg and gave me the honorific crazy. That's how it got to me. So I was afraid that history would repeat itself and decided to keep my mouth shut. But surprisingly, everyone in the class seemed to be happy with me and sometimes paid too much attention to me. I quickly became friends hey. with the guys and I even started to like school, which I had not noticed before. Do you quickly get used to new people? I finally started to understand biology, and I loved it so much that I wanted to go to medical school next year. It seemed that my life had changed a lot, and for the better, so I thought until my crazy echo of the past caught up with me in the new place. In the morning, as usual, going to school, I realized that my eyes hurt a lot. I remembered the words of my beloved grandmother and blamed it on the computer in my life. My father didn't take me to school that morning because he had a bad stomach ache and didn't know what to do with it for four days. My mother nervously put me in my father's car and drove me to school. I saw how she was going through it and I wanted to calm her down. I still don't know how I saw it, but when I looked at my dad, I saw that there was something wrong with his pancreas. It was highlighted brown on his stomach. I told my mother that. She pretended that I didn't say anything strange and just said, I guess I should check it out. I could see that she wasn't taking my words seriously, but dad was in so much pain that he was ready to believe anything to make him feel better. And he was checked. Dad was diagnosed with pancreatic inflammation. He was urgently sent for surgery and the doctor added that it was discovered just in time. At the hospital, my dad thanked me and said that I had the talent of a doctor. And I didn't know what to call it. I just saw what was inside him. Then I started to see what was inside the others. My classmate, Judy, had hernia in her back. The math teacher had heart failure. At first, it was fun to watch other people's organs, how they moved, how they didn't look like each other. But then it started to make me afraid because I could see, but I couldn't tell, and the person was suffering. There was a feeling of impotence. But how, and most importantly, what do I say? Excuse me, I have x-ray vision, <laughs> and you should get your heart checked out because you have a blocked bulb on the right ventricle of the heart. I would have laughed in the face of the person who told me this at best, and at worst, handed them over to a mental hospital. After living like this for another three months, I realized that it was unbearable. I told my mother that I could see the organs of all the people around me. My mother always knew what to do, and I thought that here, too, she would find the perfect solution. And the next week, we went to a science center. At first, I thought we were just going to the doctor, until the door slammed and we were on opposite sides of that door with my parents. Great. At that moment, I felt that my parents had brazenly betrayed me. Where did they send me? What for? I was filled with resentment and fear. I did not understand what was coming. Experiments began on me. I was placed in solitary confinement as a criminal. There was a bed 
toilet, TV, pillows, and food. Well, yes, I agree, not the most terrible cell of a prisoner, but it did not save me from the thought, when will all this end? Each morning began with tests, injections, and conversations with a man who called himself a doctor but confused medical terms. I hope he was just nervous. Then conversations with a psychologist about my childhood and parents. I didn't want to talk about them at all. Have you ever been very offended by your parents? Then you will understand for sure. The last straw of these incompetent experiments for me was the literal cruelty of the orderly. When I refused to take a pill, the employee hit me on the shoulder. I took the pill and realized that I had to run away from here. This was not easy because I was only allowed out on the street once a day at about noon and with a guard. I'm still sure that I was helped by some kind of miracle. Well, or hormones, because the guard was in love with the nurse and missed the moment of my escape. And now I was waving at him from the back of the gate. The problem with the terrible conclusion was solved, but I did not think where I would go after this prison. The only options I had were my parents, my grandmother, or an independent life. My parents might put me in that prison again or I might become a tramp in a white shirt, which was not a pleasant prospect either. So it seemed that going to my grandmother was the only sensible and pleasant option. My grandmother welcomed me with joy. I told her everything I'd been through. She was angry and promised to scold my mother for doing this to me. Grandma is funny when she's angry, and I was glad that I found support in her. Everything seemed to start going as usual. I went back to school. I didn't miss much during the week. This week passed for me as a painful year, and everyone else in school had only three math lessons. And even these terrible pictures of sick people around me disappeared. I even wondered if I was imagining it. Then it was even more insulting that I was in this cage of torture for nothing. But I couldn't believe that these organs everywhere had stopped tormenting me just like I couldn't believe my grandmother had turned me in. She told my parents where I was. And here were my precious parents standing on the doorstep with a guilty face and thinking that I would forgive them just for showing up on the doorstep of a house where they were not expected. I looked at my grandmother with the question, why are you doing this to me? She was the first to speak. She said that I got it wrong and my parents didn't know what I was going through. My mother continued and apologetically told how it really was. They took me to the examination and diagnosis of the brain to understand the cause of this phenomenon. They had no intention of dumping me on the test. Doctors, <laughs> under the pretext of suspicion of brain disorders, urged my parents to leave me for free treatment. My parents got scared and of course they said yes. And only when they came home they began to suspect that Something was wrong. <gasps> Doctors did not give them the pictures of my head, refused to let them see me, and even took away my phone. My mother got scared and started coming to the hospital every day. The nurse, in confidence, said that I was missing. My mother almost turned gray in the emergency room. She began to swear and call for the chief doctor, but there was no answer. My grandmother made the responsible decision to tell her that I was fine. I suppose I would have done the same, though I thought it was unfair and cruel of her at the time. It was like my heart was released. I realized that no one had betrayed me, and my parents didn't get rid of me as a monster that could tarnish their reputation. They love me and really want to help. My mother was determined and went to court to deal with the offenders. I don't know exactly what happened with the pseudoscience center, my mother was happy, so she had won the court. From her, I learned what really happened to me. The whole story with X-ray vision turned out to be my wild imagination and passion for medicine, plus overwork. I wasn't even upset that I wasn't special anymore. It was important to me that I was finally free from torment and that I could help people with my talent to heal and not with my 
ability to see the invisible. And now I can say what and where it hurts, only sometimes using medical tricks. And I am already looking forward to my work as a doctor, which will help hundreds and hopefully thousands of people. If you like the story, please like it. And to see more of these stories, subscribe to the channel. Appreciate your uniqueness and believe that you are surrounded by good people. Hello everyone, my name is Ellie. I'm 16 years old. Has there ever been a moment in your life when your only desire at that moment was to stop feeling pain? I stopped. And you know, it's more of a curse than a gift. I was just a normal girl my own age. School, friends, and even a boyfriend. On that fateful day, my boyfriend Andy and I agreed to meet at the playground at noon. I arrived a little early and waited for him, watching the children. I have younger brothers, and looking after the children around me is already habit. Suddenly, one boy's ball jumped to the side and rolled under the swing. One of the ball players ran over there, and I immediately tensed up. There was another child on the swing. I shouted something to both of them, but it was too late. In an instant, I ran and covered a boy with my body. Then came a blow in the back, and we were carried forward. The parents ran up to us, and I gave them the child. The baby's mother thanked me in tears, and his father started to help me get up, but I couldn't. My legs! I couldn't feel them. I couldn't feel my back either. Do you have any idea how scary it is to stop feeling something that you usually don't even pay attention to? A few minutes later, Andy came and fell down next to me. I was already in tears. I was very scared. The ambulance picked me up. Andy contacted my parents. I was urgently sent for x-ray and then for surgery after being put into a medically induced coma. At the time, I couldn't believe that my life could be turned upside down in a matter of moments. Before the coma, I spent a few minutes with relatives. I had the feeling that I was saying goodbye. And then the darkness came. I woke up in a hospital bed. My head felt like it was made of cast iron, but I could lift it to look at myself. My feet were still there. My hands too. I tried to move my arm. It worked. Not very well, but I could do it. Then I switched to my legs. I wonder if they repaired them. Yes, I could move them. The sound of a blow on the bed awakened a nurse who was dozing nearby. She called for doctors. When several doctors entered the room, I was already glowing with happiness. I can move and I don't feel any pain. But the doctors, for some reason, were not happy and said we should wait for my parents. I couldn't understand what was wrong. Within half an hour, I could move my toes. Wasn't that a good sign? When my parents arrived, doctors put everything on the table. I was operated on the same day I was admitted there. The operation was successful, but there was a medical malpractice. My nerve was damaged, and now I can't feel any pain. I said, are you kidding? But the doctors drew my attention to the fact that one of them was pricking my leg with a needle all the time. I realized I didn't feel anything at all. A week later, my parents took me home. I was not very confident on my feet. I had to learn to walk again. At home, my dad carried me in his arms, and when we went to the hospital for rehabilitation, I moved around in a wheelchair. Only there, I could walk under the supervision of doctors. All this time, I was getting used to a new, painless world. So, several months passed. It was only thanks to the support of my family and Andy, with whom I constantly texted, <laughs> that I was able to get back on my feet. And now, the physiotherapy was over. I asked my mother when I could go back to school. My mother said that I would not go to school. Certainly not this year. They were afraid I might hurt myself because I didn't feel any pain. But why? I was healthy. And the fact that I didn't feel pain was even to my advantage. For example, 
the other day, a veterinarian came to us to vaccinate our cat. I had to hold her, and even though she scratched all my hands, I did fine. And the other day, I waxed my hair. And you know, now I'm even ready to put up with it. My father said the doctors rescheduled my surgery in half a year. <sighs> then they would be able to give me back the feeling of pain, reconnecting damaged nerves. Once, I asked to go for a walk with my friends, but my parents stopped me again. They forbade me to leave the house alone. And if I tried, they would lock me in my room. What a twist! What was all the rehabilitation for? To continue living in a bubble? This is home detention and undeserved. Have you ever been tried to save or support so that it would be better to be punished? I really wanted to see my friends, but most of all, I wanted to see Andy. Parents repeated, in a couple of months, not before. I didn't like this very much. And Andy kept asking for a meeting. I decided to meet him in secret while my parents were away. On Sunday, my parents were going shopping, and we had a few hours to meet. As soon as their car was gone, Andy came in. It was the first time we'd seen each other since the incident. Before that, there were only video calls. It was strange to hold a loved one and not feel his warmth or the touch of his hands, but I was still happy. It was the first time he was at my house, and I suggested that he come up to my room while I made tea. I poured a few cups and went up to him. Putting the cups by the bed, we lay down on it. It's been so long. Maybe our love will allow us to go to a new level in the relationship. Andy took my top off, and I took off his sweater. He threw me on my back. We were in such a hurry that we pushed something off the nightstand and didn't even pay attention. We lay on top of each other and kissed. This was the first time for me. I didn't feel anything, but the thought was exciting. Suddenly, Andy's face turned purple, and he looked at me with horror and whispered, hand it I looked at my hand and went into shock myself my hand was red and blistered apparently at the moment of our intimacy I accidentally turned the cup of boiling water on myself and didn't notice what did I do we ran to the bathroom and I put my hand under the cold water damn I don't feel anything even though my hand felt like it belonged to Freddy Krueger. I looked back to thank Andy for noticing all this time, but he was gone. I went out into the hall and saw the front door open. He escaped, left me alone. Before I could recover from his betrayal, I saw the door open completely. He's back, I thought. But no, it was mom and dad. Dad was carrying bags and laughing, but when he saw me, his smile disappeared. Then there were screams, tears, and a showdown. Dad put locks on my door and on the windows in my room. My phone was taken away and the internet was turned off. I was taught by a visiting teacher. Sometimes he let me dial Andy from his phone, but he wouldn't answer it. So I lived like that for almost half a year. Sometimes I was very angry with my parents but the burns on my arm reminded me that there was some sense in their actions. The doctors finally decided that I had recovered sufficiently and performed a second operation. When I regained consciousness, I immediately realized that everything had gone well because I was in terrible pain. But I was happy with the pain. I guess over the past six months, I deserved to feel pain. After two weeks, my parents let me go to school. I was glowing with joy. This was the moment when I would see my friends again, and Andy. But I was disappointed. When I came to class, everyone looked at me strangely. I could only hear their whispers. As it turned out, my dad had come to school and had a conflict with Andy. Everyone knew and didn't want any problems. I became a loner. And Andy, he just ignored me. I had been waiting so long to get back to school, and I was greeted like this? That really hurt. At the time, I felt like my world collapsed again, but the experience made me stronger, and my resentment of my former friends was quickly forgotten.
There was no time to be upset. I had so much to try again. I'm at a different school now, and I have new friends. A new boyfriend, new interests. Sometimes, I remember that crazy year without pain. And no, I don't want to repeat it. Please like my story so that more people will see it. Maybe it will help someone solve their problem. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel so that you don't miss new interesting stories. Good luck, everyone. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Diana. I'm 15 years old and I love crows. Have you ever needed a friend's help? To borrow money or to help with a test? Or to beat the offender? What if that friend was a crow? Watch this video to the end and find out what can repay the kindness of a smart bird. I have always wanted to have animals, but I was faced with the same problem, my dad. My dad is a unique person who combines 50% anger, 30% rage, 19% stubbornness, and just 1% sanity. That's my dad. Once, we had such a severe winter in our town that even people in fur coats were cold outside. But I had to get out because I remembered that I hadn't parked my bike in the garage. And next to it, I saw a crow. It was injured. There was something wrong with its wing and it was limping. I thought that it would not survive in this weather and I shivered. Oh, I could get into trouble for this. I grabbed the crow and cursing under my breath, carried it into the house. Dad raged all night, but for once I didn't listen to him. The crow would die if I threw it out and I didn't want to kill animals. Have you ever stood up for your principles in the face of a man who could break you in half? Ugh, what a feeling. I suggested dad to wait until spring, and in return, I would not let Quasi, as I called my foundling, out of the room. Dad didn't like the idea. He said he wouldn't wash bird droppings. But I, after all, was also very angry and stubborn, and I could insist on my own. During the winter, we became very friendly with Quasi, and I almost cried when I let her out into the woods. But I had to let her out because she was stronger and could fly safely, and Dad was getting more and more angry. How was I to know that she would not leave me? Quasi began to fly to our lawn, sometimes even with friends. Good thing it always happened during the day when Dad wasn't home. I was very afraid of his anger, and I taught Quasi to fly not to the lawn, but a little further away, to the trash next to the forest. Then, there I hung out with them, fed them, and occasionally did homework. It was great! I felt like a superhero, a girl mistress of the crows. And so, my two years passed. But one time, a complete mess happened. I went with my crows to the trash, and Ramona noticed me. She was a stupid and evil viper from a rich family. Everybody was trying to butter her up because otherwise she would ruin your whole life. She was with her henchmen and started pointing like, Oh well, look, she's a bum. What could I say? Have you ever defended your honor with fists? I lunged at Ramona, but her friends intercepted me and started pulling my hair. And then this happened. Damn this! A flock of crows gathered above us, and they began to attack the kids. I didn't even notice how many of them appeared. The birds attacked Ramona and her friends, but they didn't touch me. There was a scandal waiting for me at home. A good scandal. I told my mother everything, and instead of feeling sorry for me, she told my father. He arrived in the evening in a ferocious rage. During this time, the parents of Ramona and these guys called us and started complaining, saying, your girl beat up our children. Oh, and the evil and terrible Diana single-handedly beat up two guys and three girls. Who would believe that? Dad and Mom believed it. Most of all, they were angry that I continued to feed my crows and, as they thought, set them on their abusers. All I'd been listening to all night was that my next prank would end up in jail. What was I supposed to do? Obediently take the insults? But dad wouldn't listen to me. He locked me in my room, took a rifle, and went to shoot the crows. I only heard two shots, but each of them wounded my heart. What if he had killed the quasi? 
Why were they doing this to me? I hated them. The attacks on me at school only increased. I was called Queen of the Trash. And one of Ramona's assholes stuffed a crow's corpse into my backpack. I started running away from school in tears. And I really didn't want to go home, but I had to. My father organized a kind of house arrest. Well, so that my mother immediately picked me up from school and did not let me out on the street later. I was angry. They drove me crazy. Have you ever felt that the whole world is against you? That no one, no one wants to understand you? I was crushed these days. But one day, I saw Quasi again on the lawn. We didn't see her again until the summer. Probably, my smart girl realized that there was no one else at home and decided to beckon. She looked at me and jumped a little ahead. I left the house and followed her. Quasi led me to a house in the woods, and there I saw a bunch of crows and a boy my age, maybe a little older. Quasi sat on his shoulder, and he asked what I was doing here. I told him about Quasi, and the boy was relieved and happy. He said that his name was Jamie and that he was the owner of Quasi and the other crows. Jamie and I quickly found a common language. He fed them and trained them, just like me. And he was laughed at at school too. It was great to find someone with similar problems. We started meeting, talking. He taught me how to train crows, and in general, he turned out to be a good friend. I almost believed that something good could come into my life. Alas, a couple of months later, my parents announced that we were moving to another city. And it was my fault, they said. I ruined our family's precious reputation. I shouted back that I would rather live in a dumpster and ran into the woods in tears. I met Jamie there. The news upset him as much as it did me. And he said he had a present for me then. I swallowed my tears and thought resentfully. When would he have given this gift if I hadn't turned out that we were going to break up? But all my skepticism went out of my head when he brought me a beautiful silver ring with a raven's head on it. He said that it was his mother's ring, that it had become too small for her, and that she'd allowed him to give it to the crow's friend, as she called me behind my back. I cried even more and promised him that I would never forget him without the ring. But I didn't refuse from it. For some reason, I felt I had to keep it. What would you do if your parents drastically changed your life without even asking for your permission? Parents are not classmates. You can't just go over and fight them. So they always take a high hand over their children. I let them move in, but I didn't let them get the crows and Jamie out of my heart. I was waiting for the call, for the letter, for anything. I spent days looking at the ring and thinking of my best friend and our crows. Nothing. Silence. A complete zero. But you know I'm not one to give up easily. A year later, I came to the city when I started my vacation. A school friend let me stay, and on the first day I told her, okay, I'll go to Jamie. To whom? She asked. Uh, to Jamie. What's the problem? Lucia hesitated for a long time and finally told me the terrible thing, after which I fell into a chair. It turned out that Jamie died just a few months after I left. He climbed to the roof to fix it and broke his neck in the fall. His mother left town because she couldn't live in a house that reminded her of her son. I was speechless. So that's why Jamie didn't write to me. I should have known that I should have come as soon as it happened, but how could I know? I cried all evening and all night, and the next morning, I rode my bike to Jamie's abandoned house. The crows were still nestling there, and I swear to you, they were happy to see me. The house barely appeared in the horizon, and they were already rushing toward me. They surrounded me and cawed loudly, as if asking where I'd been for so long. I looked at the ring, then at the sky, and realized that if a person's soul didn't go to heaven, then it had to become a bird. And maybe Jamie, my best friend, got lost among those crows. I went back to my new home, but I didn't forget my friends. 
I am determined to connect my life with the birds in memory of Jamie. Recently, my mother apologized to me for all that time. I don't know what made her do it, but I told her about going on vacation and for the first time, I was able to cry properly. And my dad? Well, I'm sure I took after him in my stubbornness. One day he will say, I'm sorry to me, but I don't think it'll be for a long time. Did you like the story? Then hug your pets, put a like, and other viewers will see it. And don't forget to subscribe so that you don't miss our new videos. Hi, my name is Sabrina. I know what you're thinking. A name like that witch's. I really was a witch. Do you believe in magic? I believed. Until one day, when I paid a price for my magic. Listen to the rest of this story and find out how I was buried alive. As a child, I was a normal girl. I loved horses, fairy tales, and princesses, and other chick flick moments. But everything changed when I first watched Maleficent. The film opened my eyes. In all fairy tales, villains are better than heroes. So I decided to rewatch all my favorite stories. Soon, I got to chilling adventures. From the first minute, I realized this is about me. After watching Chilling Adventures, I decided to change my image and climbed into the attic in search of a suitable outfit, but I had no idea what I was going to find there. In one of the old drawers, I found a photo album of my great grandmother. I flipped through the photos. Unbelievable! My great grandmother participated in the Sabbaths. I ran to my mother with this album and demanded an explanation. It turned out that we had roots in Salem. I had to find out the truth. We arrived at my grandmother's house and I started asking her questions. But unfortunately, my grandmother only laughed. Every girl in Salem at least once dressed up as a witch for Halloween. But they couldn't change my mind because I knew I was a witch and I was going to get my magic powers. For a start, I added more gothic to my look. Dark makeup, long black gloves, and a hat. Have you ever changed your style and felt like a new person? If yes, you can understand why I began to feel much more confident in my skills. I decided to start small, fortune telling for my two best friends. For example, looking into Kira's cup, I could see something that suggested the word danger. And just the next day, she flunked the test. The prediction came true. Looking at my friend Lisa's hand, I saw something that suggested the word love. And just three days later, a new kid appeared at school and she immediately fell in love with him. Soon, Lisa asked to charm him. Well, how could I resist? I read on the internet about the rules of the ritual, and the next day after school, we performed the ceremony. It took two weeks, and at recess, the new kid came to us. He said that we had not taken our eyes off of him for two weeks, but we knew that magic had worked. The new guy's name was Rich. He was a good guy, but his friends? They were something. This was a group from a private school. Cool guys, goths, absolutely crazy. With Richie's help, we were able to meet them, and thanks to my magic and predictions, we were accepted into their company. But soon, the stakes increased. Rich managed to find the spell book in one of the old antique shops. I took it upon myself to test them. Sit ventures, Felix, deuces, I whispered to my friend, and on the next test, she was able to score the passing grade. Yut, maledistri, tibi, a respondisim, es pro pasalis, I shouted, pointing at bully Mickey. After two weeks, we found out that she was expelled from school for smoking. But you must admit that predictions and witchmongering are not quite what you imagine when thinking of a witch's magical power. I wanted to turn people into animals with a snap of my fingers, read minds, throw fireballs in the end.
God, what a fool I was. In the Book of Spells, we found a witch's ritual. The complicated ritual that was supposed to reveal all of my magical powers. The ritual was just crazy. On a full moon, I had to drink a potion that was supposed to kill me. Then I had to be buried in a coffin from which I had to get out by my magic on my own. At first, I refused. But every day, my curiosity and thirst for magic power were eating me up more and more. And this crazy company, every day, edged me on. Let's perform a ritual. You want to become a real witch? After a week of constant persuasion and self-persuasion, I agreed. It was not difficult to prepare. We bought a coffin and also brewed a potion from herbs and animal organs. Don't ask how much we had to pay veterinarian clinics cleaner for this. And now the full moon came. We gathered in the most remote part of the park where no one could distract us. Have you ever done something forbidden? Do you know what an adrenaline rush, the very thought of it, gives you? Copious veneer, I chanted as the guys circled around me in a mad dance. Copious veneer, I shouted before drinking a potion made from rat tails and cat glands. Copious veneer, I whispered, shivering with euphoria and excitement trying not to throw up the potion. Everything froze. Everyone froze. And then I fell. I couldn't move. Couldn't breathe properly. Couldn't even control my eyes. Complete paralysis. My friends gathered around me, and one of them felt my pulse. She's dead, I heard my friend whisper. I'm alive! Does a dead person remain conscious? Panic washed over me. And then one of the guys said, We need to finish what we started. This is what Sabrina would like. I was picked up and carried gently into the coffin. Stop! No! Don't bury me! I, I don't want to! But none of them heard my silent cries. None of them could read my screaming thoughts. They put me in the coffin. Rich carefully covered my eyes. Then I heard the lid of my coffin being nailed down. The box was lifted and thrown into the pit. I felt a thud followed by the sound of shovels and earth. A bit of dirt got on my face. It became harder to breathe. I called up all my strength. <sighs> A barely audible exhale, but no more. My friends made noises with their shovels for a long time, while my tears flowed soundlessly through my closed eyes. How long had it been? I lost count. I couldn't sleep, or rather, my body and my brain were already asleep, but not my mind. I tried counting, hoping to kill time. 320,131. 320,132. I peed myself. Now, it became hard to breathe. I had a dream about my great-grandmother. She said, if you promise not to play with magic, I'll let you out. I made a promise. God, I promised with all my heart. Nothing happened. I could feel the worms crawling around me. I could feel my wet feet starting to rot. I felt like I was going to die. Great grandmother, you promised to save me. Or maybe calling her was magic too. I wanted to die. There was less and less air. But it didn't seem to end. I couldn't swallow my tongue or hold my breath, but I wanted to die. The seconds faded into eternity. I was ready to draw my last breath. And then suddenly, the ground began to shake. I heard voices. The lid of my coffin flew off, and I felt a rush of fresh air. At the same time, I heard the voice of my friends. Ugh! Is it rotting? God, I'm going to be sick. Then Rich said, It looks like the magic didn't work. I suggest we bury her and forget about it. I don't think they'll find her here anytime soon. I knew it was now or never. I called up the last bit of my strength, opened my eyes with difficulty, and began to wheeze. My entire company fled in horror, all but Rich. He grabbed my arm and felt my pulse. At this point, I finally blanked out. 
I came to my senses in the hospital. Catatonic stupor. This was my diagnosis. Because of the stress, the pressure of the corset, and the potion I drank, my brain failed me, and I just lost control. And then I lay in a coffin for three days, slowly dying of oxygen starvation. My friends got tired of waiting and decided to dig me out. Just in time. A few more hours, and I'd be dead. Yeah, triple bad luck. The terrible quality of the coffin. The inaction of the police, who began to look for me only after two days of disappearance. And friend idiots, who believed that I was really a witch. Did you foolishly risk your life? Tell us about it in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. There are many more interesting stories waiting for you. Hi, I'm Lisa and I'm 16 years old. Do you have any phobias? Like, are you scared of anything? Some people are scared of the dark or clowns. What am I scared of? Honestly, I'm scared of everything, but spiders take the rain. Gross, disgusting, dangerous critters from hell. <laughs> that for some unknown reason invaded our poor planet. I have a hard time thinking about it even now, but a year ago I almost went crazy with fear. Why? Let me tell you. So we moved from Virginia to Texas and I hated it. First of all, it was freezing as hell in winter and started in damn November, what the heck? But it was just half of our problem. Our house, how do I put it? Have you ever been to a haunted house in Disneyland? Well, our house is pretty similar to that. It's not a castle or anything, but it's the same atmosphere. It's old, spacious, and creepy. Seriously, okay, there wasn't a single light room in there. And some, for example, in mine, the sun would only peek through in the evening when it was setting down, and the rest of the time it was just darkness. And the floor? It was constantly squeaking. But the suckiest part was that there were all these stupid insects. Seriously, in the beginning we had to call pest control a lot. The room floor was loaded with dead roaches. And there were bed bugs too! At nights the air was filled with the buzzing of moths and of course there were spiders! I'd put it as monster-sized spiders. Tropical tarantulas are possibly bigger, but I'm not sure and I don't even want to know, but these spiders were huge. I was mortified by tiny ones, but these were the size of my hand, I'm not kidding. Of course you might think that it's silly to be scared of just insects, but WTF, some people are scared of water, okay? Anything wrong with having this phobia? Mm -mm. One day I saw a spider crawling up my clothes in the bathroom. I was hysterical and just lost it. I refused to even get dressed. I didn't even want to go back to that bathroom. It seemed to me that the critter was the size of the palm of my hand, if not bigger. Everyone was trying to calm me down, but I simply couldn't calm down. I was scared to death that I couldn't fall asleep at night. I kept thinking that these goddamn spiders were everywhere, and not only in their freaking spider webs in the corner, but also because they're crawling everywhere, on the tables, floors, on my bed. Ugh, what was happening reminded me of a zombie apocalypse, and the goal is to torture me until I die. Finally, I passed out, but I slept really uneasily. I kept having nightmares about spiders, and there were more and more and more of them. Crap, God damn it! I wasn't able to get rid of them! All of a sudden, through my dream, I felt the touch of the spider's legs, and they tickled my neck and started crawling up my face. I was fighting, trying to knock it off me, but I couldn't get rid of this creepy, crawly feeling. Then I realized that it was a dream and opened my eyes. It wasn't easy, because for three seconds I was laying down without taking a breath or exhaling, and just stared at the ceiling trying to figure out where I was. I then rolled off the bed screaming bloody murder, and started jumping on one foot, rubbing my ear and neck like crazy trying to obliterate the creature out of my body. My parents stormed in when they heard my screams and wondered what was going on. A spider crawled into me! This freaking hairy tarantula beast! I I don't know what to do, it's gonna lay eggs inside me, right? Am I right? They try to calm me down saying, Honey, spiders don't crawl into people's bodies and lay eggs. They're not maggots. But I don't know what they were trying to do. Oh god, where did I read about it? Online? Fuck that, I need to get it out of me right now. Mom agreed to get my ears checked out, but she didn't really pay close enough attention, so 
When she said she didn't see anything, I of course didn't believe her. How could she see anything when she only took a quick three-second look? Mom, please look closer. What if it's deep inside? Mom suddenly got mad at me and told me to go back to bed and stop making up weird stuff. I yelled back at her that I can't sleep while I have this weird freaky spider crawling inside me. Dad saved the day. He said that spiders don't eat human flesh, and if the spider is hungry and doesn't want to starve to death inside me, it'll crawl out sooner or later. Sooner or later. Yeah, right. Great job with this encouragement. In the morning, nobody even bothered to ask, How are you feeling, Lisa? Or, How is that giant hideous death spider that's eating you from the inside doing? Nope, nothing at all. Like nothing happened that night. I was completely messed up. I was already feeling terrible. Awful. Horrible. And nobody even cared about it. The next morning, I felt all right. But by the time it was afternoon, I felt like there were small, creepy, crawly legs moving inside my throat. So I rushed to the bathroom to puke this monster out of me. But no matter how hard I tried, nothing worked. The critter wouldn't leave me alone. I felt it moving into my lungs. I killed a day just thinking of ways to get this thing out. What do they eat? Sugar? Honey? I googled similar cases but couldn't find anything. Like seriously, nothing. I wasn't getting any better. Every day I kept complaining that this piece of crap was biting me from the inside. Every day I felt like it was getting more and more comfortable in my body, like it was its new home. Every day I was begging my parents to take me to the hospital or to get an x-ray or an MRI or something like that. But they refused. They didn't believe at all that something terrible was happening to me. As a result, I developed really weird thoughts. For example, like empty, dark bathrooms of our new house. I started liking them. And at school, when a guy asked me to move rudely, for a moment I felt like digging into his face with my teeth. That never happened before. I was hearing weird random quotes in my head from books or conversations maybe. But the issue was that I never read them or even met the people, so I couldn't figure out what was the reason that I was hearing them. Did I know what was going on? Was it normal? Yeah, I'm not a complete idiot. I was really scared to death, but nobody even put an effort to help. I couldn't manage it myself. I couldn't deal with it. I was only 16. In the end, I reached out to my parents again. I knew that if I kept silent, I would most likely go crazy and wouldn't be able to deal with my issues. Besides, I was hoping that this time mom and dad would take my problem seriously and let me have that freaking x-ray or get the spider out somehow. They did take it seriously, but their reaction was a little different than I expected. Yes, 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 they said. Yes, yes, yes. Wow, it's not good. We need to go to the doctor. I was so relieved that I was finally able to get through to them that I went into the backseat of the car without any suspicions. But when having a conversation with the doctor, I realized that something was up. He didn't offer to do an x-ray, but was asking a lot of questions about the voices in my head and my fear of spiders. And then I read the sign. It was a psychiatric ward. I got so mad. I went off on my parents, doctor, and even the receptionist girl. I was yelling that they betrayed me and lied to me and that I refused to live with them from now on and I'd never stay in this clinic. They tried to give me a sedative shot, but I got out because my parents didn't hold me tight enough. I was running out on the street, and a voice in my head kept repeating, Kill, kill, kill. I didn't get far. Security apprehended me and brought me back. I was crying like a baby. I felt like this was it. My life was over. I felt little spider legs stomping all over my heart on the inside, and I knew that the clinic would help the spider to eat me until the end of time. All of a sudden, the doctor asked, Do you want us to give you an x-ray? I answered, Yes, that's the only thing I want. And he simply replied, Okay, let's schedule you for tomorrow. How would you feel if you'd suddenly get what you've been dreaming about for so long? I simply couldn't believe it. Could my issue really be resolved that easily? I was trying to make my parents cave in and just do it for such a long time, and now the doctor's offering it to me just like that? I actually got the x-ray the next day, and it showed that I had nothing inside me. But wait... What about all those sensations? The voices in my head? The doctor explained that I could actually have swallowed a spider in my sleep, but it wouldn't be able to survive inside me and most likely would just die in my stomach and come out the natural way. That happens sometimes, pretty rare though. But after that, people can indeed feel fear, panic, and paranoia. I do need to take care of my mental health, 
but my fear wasn't that self-created like my parents thought. I was about to jump around from joy and the doctor turned out to be amazing and took care of my issues and was considerate of my problems. He persuaded my parents that it's not the best thing to do. To live in a scary house full of spiders when your child has an anxiety and phobias. So we moved into a less spacious house. But at least I wasn't loaded with freaking insects. I learned to deal with all my fears and control myself. The voices in my head were subdued emotions. And now I'm learning to open up more in order to get rid of them. And I drank the whole bottle of tea tree just to make sure to get rid of the spider leftovers. Subscribe to our channel and send in your interesting stories. What if your life is even more exciting than mine? <laughs>